thank you to everyone for being here and uh, thanks to, to Tony. Uh, Rasan have already told us that we are going to have an hour. The way the hour is going to be used is uh, I will introduce uh, Tony and I will allow him to speak about 40 minutes to 45 minutes and thereafter we will have uh, Q&A. I think uh, it's important to know who's Tony. His name is uh, Berimo Anthony Bogus, born in Jamaica. He is a writer, scholar, and curator. He has authored and edited nine books in the field of black radical black political thought, Caribbean intellectual history, and Caribbean art. He is currently working on a book titled Black Critique and a project on the political thought of Michael Melny and Jamaica in the 1970s. He is also co-editing some of the unpublished writing of Sylvia Winter and writing a volume on Haitian art. He is the Asa Mesa Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory at Brown University, the inaugural director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, Brown University, and a Honorary Professor at the University of Cape Town and a visiting professor of African and African diasporic thought at the Free University of Amsterdam. He has curated art exhibition in the Caribbean, South Africa, and the US. I think to save time since we are running late, I would rather ask Tony to, to take us through. The title of his presentation is Reflecting on a Politics of Culture, the 1956 Black Writers and Artists Conference. Paris. So I'll give to you. Welcome. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you uh, very, very much uh, for that introduction. And also thanks to the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak. I understand the technical problems. So even though it is very early morning here, um, no difficulty. Um, I was able to do some other things while waiting. Uh, six, to six, six to six years ago, a seminal event occurred in Paris at the Sorbonne. The 1956 Black Writers and Artists Conference occurred one year after the Bandung meeting of April 1955. The meeting in Paris of the Black Writers Conference in the words of the key organizer, Alone Diop, was, as he says, a grand event, quote Diop, in the conscience of the world, end of quote. For many of the over 60 participants, the Congress was understood as a follow-up to the political demands made at Bangdong the previous year. But there were two distinctive elements to this 1956 conference that made it different from Bangdong. Firstly, that the participants themselves were deeply aware of what they called atomic energy. The introduction to the conference published in Presence Africans, which introduced the papers after the conference was held notes the following. Atomic power, the introduction says, creates an imagined, unimagined new emphasis upon the questions of social justice, national sovereignty, and international accord. So the first difference is the difference that they noted was around that of atomic energy. The second difference with the Bandung Conference was the central preoccupation of the Congress with culture. This was the issue that was most fiercely debated at the Congress, particularly the debates which were generated by Leopold Senger's speech on the first day. It is important to note that the ways in which the conference debated and discussed culture was not about just culture writ large, about artists and writers 
but that it discussed culture within the context of, of what the conference called the committed artist. This idea of the committed artist, of course, drew from Jean-Paul Sartre's conceptions of commitment. Such a commitment, Jean-Paul Sartre would argue, was about the need to deal with and to act in, with, in social and political reform. Of course, we know that for Sartre, only literature had the capacity to do this. Only literature, Sartre argued, had the capacity to make meaning, and therefore, in his words, to make meaningful art. However, the ways in which the key figures of this conference in 56 thought about committed artists, that is the fig people like Senghor, Jacques Stephen Alexis from Haiti, Franz Fanon, Amy Césaire, Richard Wright, was that they thought that the committed artist was, was because was really also people who were involved in, uh, in music and in painting. For them and for the conference, they had the argument that culture had to work closely with politics. Because culture, they argued, some of them argued, was the vital effort through which each race and individual by his or her experience, his or experience and aspirations, their work and reflections could now reconstruct a world which is filled with life. And the key here is how culture is related both to questions of aspiration and the way it is filled with life. This definition about culture and its relationship to experience aspirations and the reconstructing a world which is filled with life was the context could only be understood within the context of what Amy Césaire called, quote, the colonial situation. And this colonial situation, I would then argue, became the conceptual frame which emerged from the conference. It is interesting that this emerges because it, the conference happens one year before Ghanaian independence in 57. But all of this means that the, in the words of people like Cesare and others, that the black artists should begin to work to make our culture, and here I'm quoting, a force of liberation. This is what Diab says, that our culture should become a force of liberation and solidarity. And at the same time, Diab argues, becomes, uh, becomes a hymn, I'm quoting him here, continue, of our most innermost personality. End of quote. Could we see slide two, please? The committed artist, therefore, was a radical anti-colonial figure. The subject which would, which would animate this conference was though this. What was it that constituted that radicality? And how could it relate to conventional African culture? Slide two, please. I want to spend the rest of my remarks addressing this question with brief references to the speeches of Senghor, Fanon, Jacques Alexis response to Senghor, and then end with Césaire's attempt to steer the debate from concepts of personality to what and what might be essential, what might be considered essential Africanness to a more complicated idea of culture which draws in Césaire's thought from two things. One, his experiences in Haiti in the 1940s, and secondly, his own particular position in 1956, which was, can be seen from the letter of resignation to the French Communist Party, where he writes the following, that the, the colonial question and the question of blackness or the question of the quote unquote Negro is really a unique one. 
it's a unique position of race and colonialism because he argues uh, this is uh, something that no other race of persons have experienced and that therefore the French communism, he would argue in this letter, cannot subsume the questions of race and, 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 and anti-colonialism under its rubric. Okay, so that's setting the stage. And what then the Senghor says, which activates the debate and intense discussion, which goes, which goes on for some days. Since Senghor opens the conference after Diab makes his introductory speeches, on the 19th September at 10 o'clock in the morning, the topic of his talk is <clears throat> the spirit of civilization, of civilization <clears throat> or the laws of African Negro culture. In this particular talk, Senghor notes the centrality of Bangdong. And he makes a point that Bangdong is an important date in the history of the world. And indeed, he goes on to argue the history of what he then calls colored people. Then he makes the point that Europe now has to deal with Africa because of the explosion of African art in the early 20th century. And here, of course, he is referring to the, the work of so-called primitivism in, and, and the, the ways in which uh, people like Picasso and Matisse would visit the African colonial markets in Paris uh, and the ways, obviously, in which Picasso was influenced by African art. Senghor then makes the point, however, that if Negro writers and artists of today want to finish off the point but wants to finish off the work in the Bangdong spirit, they must go, he says, and here I'm quoting him, to the school in Negro Africa. From this particular position, he delivers a summary of his own formulation of negritude, responding in fact to criticisms that have been made about negritude. He says, yes, <clears throat> the Negro, he says, is a man of nature. But it is, he says, is not devoid of reason. And he says, parenthetically, some people have said that, but that's not what I have said. He then goes on to say, this reason of the Negro, he says, is not discursive. It is synthetic. It is another form of knowledge, Senghor says. He then concludes this particular section of his talk by saying, the white person why, sorry, white reason is analytical through utilization. Negro reason, Senghor says, is intuitive through participation. He develops these arguments, for example, by looking at surrealism and argue that there is a form of Negro surrealism, but he says it is Negro surrealism is mythic and metaphysical while European surrealism, he says, is empiric. He ends his speech this way. The spirit of civilization and the laws of the African Negro is common to all Blacks, end of quote. And here in this speech, Richard Wright, the African-American writer, immediately takes the floor and declares that he feels uncomfortable with Singor's speech, and he notes that while he was stu stupefied with admiration, and here I'm quoting Richard Wright directly, that Senghor's speech was for him very troubling. The trouble, he says, is that he cannot see himself as an African-American fitting into this particular con conception of Negro cult, African Negro culture, which Senghor has posited. His concern was immediately echoed by Jacques Alexis, the Haitian communist, novelist, and the medical doctor who was assassinated by the Duvalier regime later on. Using the work of Jean Priest Mars, who was the chair of the Haitian intellectual, who was the chair of the, of, the, of the conference and who had written the very important text in 1928, so spoke uncle in the middle of the, of the US occupation of Haiti. Alexis, uh, Alexis argues uh, 
that Senghor's framing argument about culture, he says, is narrow and static. For him, he wants to, he wants to posit a different understanding of culture, where he says, and here I quote Alexis, culture is a factor which concerns all men, but he says is shaped by national circumstances. For Alexis, therefore, because culture is shaped by national circumstances, he is in disagreement with any conception which would tend to make, and here I quote Alexis again, Africa a confused mass, end of quote. For some, this would seem to be a debate about between Africans in the diaspora and continental Africans, but I would want to differ. I would want to suggest that rather what was at stake here in this debate was a, cult, was a set of definitions and meaning about culture itself. In this particular debate, there were two things that were missing. One, questions of race, and obviously the questions of culture. Fanon speaks the next day, and his, his talk is titled Racism and Culture. And in it, he makes, an attempt, he makes an attempt to both give a definition of culture, but also to insist in that, in that definition that you have, one has to think about the questions of race. Racism, he argues, is, uh, he says, but one larger element of the whole oppression of people. And then he goes on to make the point that culture is connected to a series of practices on, and of life. And then from that position argues that racism works through culture. He then notes, he Fanon then notes, that we have to think about the question of rediscovery of quote unquote native culture. And this is obviously a gesture to Senghor. But in this gesture to Senghor, he wants to make the point, and here I quote it, that the plunge into the gulf of the past, Fanon says, is the condition and source of liberty, end of quote. But I, he also goes on to make that it is not everything. And it is not everything because for Fanon, therefore, the question of culture and race is tied very actively and intimately to the business of, of struggle against colonialism. What is unusual about Fanon's presentation or the reaction to Fanon's presentation was that there was no discussion. There was no debate at all around Fanon's position. And this is unusual because when you read the proceedings of the conference, every major presentation has debates. Have, as moments of debates of you know, people arguing around the issues. But in the finance case, there wasn't anything. And when I have queried George Lamin, who's still alive and who was at the conference and who delivered a talk on the Negro writer, um, he, uh, he says to me that Fanon left the conference very angry and was angry for a brief moment, for brief moments after his speech. Why he was angry, one is not sure. But what is clear is the unusualness of no debate about what he says. At the same speaks at nine o'clock at night, Amy Cesare takes the podium. His talk is titled Culture and Colonialism. And what he wants to do is that if Fanon speaks about the question of race and racism, Amy Cesare wants to point to the business of the, what he calls the colonial situation. He, he says, whether we like it or not, we cannot pose the problem of native culture. And I think this is really important because what has been, you know, is what is, is, is to note the differences between Senghor and Cesare. Senghor is speaking directly to what he calls Negro African culture. Césaire is speaking about what he calls native culture. So Césaire says we cannot think about the problem of native culture without posing the problem of colonialism, Césaire says. 
for all native culture, um, cultures themselves are today developing under the peculiar influence of the colonial situation. So that Fanon is about racism, Césaire is about, is about colonial problem. From this particular position, therefore, of the thinking about the colonialism and the quote unquote native culture, Césaire wants to think about this question of culture and, and, and politics. Speaking to the questions raised by Alexis and, and, and Wright about whether or not there's a homogeneous African culture, Césaire wants to argue for what he calls a double solidarity. And there are two, this, two kinds of solidarity he argues for are firstly, what he calls horizontal solidarity, and secondly, a solidarity which he calls uh, solidarity in time. For solidarity in time, he means that, and here I quote him, we, meaning all Black people, all Africans, have started from, the, uh, from an original unity, the unity, Césaire says, of African civilization. But this unity, Césaire continues, has become diversified into a whole series of cultures, all of which, though he says, in varying degrees, owe something to that original civilization of Africa. Césaire then notes that both horizontal and solidarity and solidarity in Tang are complementary. He then goes on to make the point that for this particular conference, it is a historic meeting, he says, after Bangdong. And it is not just a cultural event, he was on to argue. It is, a, it is a political event. It is a political event, he says, because colon colonialism kills culture. And he wants to argue that the work, therefore, of the artist and of the writer is to, in fact, uh, redefine this, this, this native culture in defiance of the politics of colonialism. What can we conclude from this seminal meeting hosted by Presence Africans? Firstly, that the, the debates about culture were critical, that there was an attempt to develop a new definition of the committed artist. And that this, this definition went beyond Jean Paul, Paul Sartre's definition and included both the art, both people who were involved in painting and sculpting, as well as in music. Secondly, that there was a debate and I think an emerging consensus, and I've not gone through the entire conference, obviously, around this business of what our an understanding of the what some of people have called Af original African unity. But that, that this African original African unity was now, had now dispersed and found itself or, or reorganized and adapted itself in quote unquote, what was called national formations. And then thirdly, there was this idea of solidarity, the solidarity that Cesar spoke about. But even if Cesar did not spoke about, speak about this, one of the key things about this conference was the idea of trying to think through this question of solidarity. On what basis would both Africa, continental Africans and the African diaspora unite in the faces in the face of colonialism and anti-black race and anti and anti-black racism? Fourthly, I think this conference made it clear that there was a close relationship between politics and and, and culture, and that that they and that in for culture we're not do, one is not no, uh, trying to talk about culture quote unquote in the service of politics, but rather that culture itself was a terrain of struggle, and it was a terrain of struggle for two reasons amongst many others. One that it was in the act of cultural acts itself that the possibilities and the potential potentialities of recognition was understood to be seen. And secondly, that because the colonial project, which was also a racial project, stripped 
Africans of their humanity, then the act of cultural resistance, if you want to call it that, the act of actually performing culture in whatever ways that was being done was an act, was an actually act of a revalidation of self and being human. All these issues I would want to argue, be, be press themselves in the 56, 56 conference, but also press themselves in the conference which was held after in Rome, the second conference, and then became part of a set of discussions and debate in Nigeria and, and, and in Nigeria and, uh, and, and at the various uh, festivals. But this importance of the 56 conference is that these particular issues were raised, debated, argued, and disagreed about. And that therefore to think of 56 conflict is to actually begin to see in the middle of the 20th century, how a set of writers, both from the Caribbean, from Africa, from the United States, uh, some people living in Europe, how they began to think around these questions of, of culture and its relationship uh, to politics. There's one final point I would know, note, and that there was in this conference a discussion which I would like to call a uh, discussion about epistemology and its relationship to politics. And that is the paper presented by George Lamin about the Negro writer and the question of naming. And for Lamin, the question of naming becomes an important anti-colonial act, yes, but it also is, a, is an epistemological act because from naming, you are then able to construct a set of understandings, not just about self and about community, but you also begin to understand, you can construct a different language about who you are and where you want, to, where the community wants to go. In the end, therefore, this particular conference is seminal, it is a seminal in African and African dance for thought and culture. It is seminal um, in ways that I don't think we have thought about. It is, uh, there are difficulties with the conference. Um, part of the difficulties has to do with the absence of women in the, in, in, in the conference, except there being typists and, and, sec and secretaries uh, to, to, the, to the conference. And obviously the language of 56 only talks about, um, uh, uh, talks about men. But in spite of that, I would want to argue that this is a conference that deserves our attention. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you, Tony. I think at this point, I'm going to call for questions, for comments. Why, while people are, are thinking, maybe I should uh, start the conversation. Uh, you, you've provided a lot of uh, insightful point, but also point that require thinking. No wonder we are still struggling to formulate questions. Having spent time uh, reading and formulating this argument, Tony, what do you think should we take from that conference? In particular, the two points you started with and what you close with, the question of culture and the committed artist. I'm asking this in light of the kind of condition under which art is produced under the colonial setup. So now that we have moved not so far from those conditions because they keep on propelling even today. So what should we be thinking of what those debates are helping us to think about the contemporary? Yeah, I mean, that's a very, yeah, that's a very good uh, uh, question. And um, I think that in the contemporary moment, um, one of the things that's different is the 
um, are the ways in which uh, art and and here I you know and culture, black culture generally, um, uh, moves about uh, the world. The problem I think that one may face is a certain commodification process, a certain process of marketization um, within this, uh, within as as this as black culture moves about. It has not yet is. It, I mean, it's a, and it's a complicated problem because there's still the difficulty of, um, you know, of black culture and representation in some spaces. I mean, so that's, you know, that's still there. But, the, but there's also a way in which what is represented is very much uh, determined and, and shaped by markets. And then and, and, and shaped by the market, it does not in my view, um, think uh, extra deeply enough in many ways, some do quite frankly, but not everything does um, about black life today. So that's, that's, my first, that's my first response. My second response is to, is to, to think about um, black life today in the post-colonial, post-apartheid, quote unquote, post-civil rights moment is so to think in a much more complicated way about black life. Um, that they, you know, when these fellows were writing in 56 or talking in 56, the colonial, you know, the, um, they were still, uh, you know, the Caribbean was still colonies. Most of Africa, except Ghana, you know, was, a, you know, the independence was not, on, was not yet there. Um, you know, in uh, you know, Ghana, when, as I said, got independence in '57, and so that there was uh, the, the world, the, the colonial structures were still in place, um, juridically and, and politically. Um, today, those structures are not in place juridically and politically, um, but I think they are still in place in, in, in uh, uh, epistemologically. And they're still in place in 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 uh, in, in the way we think about um, all the certain things, and so that for me, therefore, the 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 question of uh, black art today, given all of these different uh, changes, uh, has got to be focused on one a certain kind of what I would call continued struggle for a radical form of decolonization. Um, and but secondly, has to do that within the the the, the framework of recognizing um, that there are dif dis distinct differences today, and and there's the emergence of new black populations that we want to think about. So you know we want to, you know we want to think about the the, uh, the emergence in, in Europe of a very active and, and larger black population that say than that existed when you know when various uh, metropolitan centers were the at the heart of the colonial empire. So to me those are those are those are some of the things. I still think that the question of um, commitment is is important. Um, but then you know there are I'm there are many artists and writers who do not necessarily think that is so and that's fine as well I, I, I am not, I don't you know I don't hold a position that if you don't think in a certain way then you know you should not do certain things that's not my position at all but I think that the ways in which we have we have to think about black life um, is really very critical if I could add one other uh, and its complexities today if I could add one other point and, and that has to do, um, which is one of the reasons why I think Ryerson asked me to, um, and Andrew asked me to be here, is that there is, um, in this particular, um, in this particular conference in '56, a question was not raised, and that's the relationship between culture and publics. It was raised in first act. It was raised in Algeria, after and so on, and raised in the various festivals. It was raised in the Caribbean, in Carifesta, as late as 1976. 
And I think that is, that's still a question that we have to think about. What is the relationship between art and the publics? That is, who is it that we want? Um, who, do, who are we speaking for? And we're speaking for in quotation marks, but who do we want to visit what it is that we do, the performances, the, the art, the, the paintings and the sculptures that are made, et cetera. Um, all those things I think are really still important because in many places in the post-colonial world, in the post-apartheid, um, the cultural practices are quote unquote elite practices. Um, and so the question of publics, I think, um, something which Ryerson raises in his own work, um, which, you know, any given Sunday in Cape Town and other things that he has done, uh, is something I think that not raised at this conference, but it's a new question which we need to think about. So it's not just committed artists speaking on behalf of, but finding ways in which now we can, the, your one the question of your art and so on, for art is, is, is actually deeply connected to, um, to creating a different set of publics. Thank you, thank you, Tony. Any questions, any comments? Bonjour. Thank you, Professor, for your, your intervention. I want just to have an action. Can you give us some information about the difference of uh, concept of negritude between, for example, uh, Songor, Césaire, and Richard Wright, and other black intellectuals, please? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's, the, that's a really good question, and that would, that would take us hours, actually. So, I, so let me try and see if I can do this uh, briefly. Let me say for Richard Wright, negritude was not, um, was not something that he, he held to. Um, they were, he had enormous respect for Senghor, as, as all of them did at that point in time. But he, didn't, he wasn't happy at all with negritude. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that part of that had to do with um, Wright's own move from a certain kind of understanding of culture and its relationship to Marxism, which he was back when he wrote Native Son and so on. But also by the time he was living in Paris, his, um, his shift to uh, a certain kind of uh, philosophical existentialism, um, and uh, which would not, I think, allow him to do that. And then thirdly, uh, our next thing I think importantly is that um, Richard, for all his particular sympathy to continental Africa, um, um, I think never quite understood or, or, or grappled, I think, adequately with Africa itself. His, his, his writings of when he visits Kwame Nkrumah, Ghana, is, I would let me put it uh, gently, was not his best. Um, he missed a whole set of things. Um, and so that I think that what you're looking at, therefore, is a, um, a certain blindness in trying to grapple, and I, this is not an accusation, certain blindness on his part in trying to grapple with what Africa was. And therefore, his, his hesitation about negritude, I think, also comes from that position. Now, the, the more difficult question is Césaire and Senghor. Um, both of them were, as you all know, were very close. Um, you know, I um, and 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 in the imaginary, the kind of black intellectual imaginary around uh, you know about African and African diaspora thought, both are seen as uh, seminal figures uh, who just you know who were close as uh, intellectual brothers. Let's put it let's put it that way. Um, I mean, so much so. Um, in the imaginary that, you know, I was in Dakar about, what, about a month ago. I walked into a bookstore um, and I, what I, I saw both Senghor and Césaire, but what struck me was that I saw unpublished stuff of Césaire in Dakar that I had not seen before. And that just struck me that, that okay, there, there's, a, there's an imaginary about these two figures. And I met scholars who were done um, their PhDs on both. So that to me was, it tells me something about 
a certain imaginary that's been created about him, you know, about black, those two black intellectuals. I think that for both of them, when they began to write and think about negritude, since this is there in, in the student newspaper, both of them in the student newspapers when, when, they're, when they're in Paris, um, that they were actually drawing from each other. Césaire as a, a, a Martinican, you know, Caribbean, uh, French colony, Senghor as, you know, African, uh, you know, West African, uh, and, uh, you know, again, a, a French, French colony. And what the, the if, when you read um, Césaire's uh, Return to My Native Land, you can see the deep influences of the original discussions between them around, around about negritude. However, I would want to then say that when, Cis, when Césaire leaves Paris and returns to Martinique um, and visits, uh, firstly visits Haiti, and I think this is important because this is left out of the intellectual story because it is, is, not, on, is not seen as central to this. Um, that when he gets to Haiti, he, there are two things that, um, that, that, that impresses him. One is that he begins to think about Haiti as a site of the first colonial problem um, in the Black world. In the you know in the in this because it, you know it's the 1700s and the revolution and so on and so forth and you see this in his book on Toussaint Louverture um, and the colonial problem, but secondly he makes a point he he says that what he sees in Haiti is negritude. That's interesting an interesting comment because what he is seeing in Haiti is what Jean Prismars the person who was the the chair of the conference. Is talk is saying that you know there's a certain Africanness to Haiti, and it is African. It is not you know it is not um, Senegalese. It is not um, you know it is not Nigerian. It is African because the ways in which um, the different African ethnic groups reorganize uh, particularly religious practices and 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 concept and cosmologies about life and so on draws from different uh, ethnic um, ethnic groups and and, for, and and is reformulated into into the city into some kind of hate, quote unquote Haitian um, understanding so much so that Jean Prismars calls this um, you know called Haiti liquid Dahomey but what I think Césaire is seeing is a is this this amalgamation and aggregation of different uh, different African um, you know, cosmologies into some kind of uh, unitary cosmology that is an, an unitary forms of cultural practice, uh, which he which he sees and he's in, and he calls this um, and he calls this negritude. The other thing I think that 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 is that is important is that as he becomes a politician in Martinique and focuses a great deal on the cult and the questions of the colonial problem and what to do about Martinique. He, he is also thinking very closely now of what he calls native culture. So that what you can, in the upper words, the point I'm making is that you can see him beginning to drift from some of the original conceptions that he and uh, Senghor developed together while you know first as students and then as adults in Paris, that they, their trajectories begin to take them into, into, into different spaces. He never says there never um, says uh, he never condemns and he never um, you know disavows negritude. But I think that when you begin to look at his work um, as you know and it's a rich um, set of work volumes uh, uh, you know uh, you will begin to see how he begins to shift his position from this original, um, is from the original thing that the positions that he and Senghor developed. My view would be, and I stand to be corrected, obviously, is that Senghor, um, while his views may have shifted, did not shift in the, in the dramatic ways that Césaire shifted. Um, and so I think that what you're looking at is the, is the following. A formulation of negritude in which Africa is central. 
in which the questions to put the courses there is um, return to my native land. Um, you know, it is about, uh, you know, Africa and African peoples, and he would say African man, both would, um, is, 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 um, is dominated by nature, but it's a different kind of nature. It has a certain kind of reason which Singor would says would be, syn would be synthetic rather than the kind of reason of analytical. Um, that, that, that would be, you know, that, that would be the, the, the position. And Return to My Native Land is an, a, really a remarkable poem that, that, that expresses negritude, I think. By time, though, you get to, he goes to Haiti and he goes to Martin and becomes in politics, you begin to see the certain differences. And that difference, I think, can be seen sharply in the 56th conference, um, where Senghor is speaking around African personality and so on, and civilization, and, Senghor, and, and Césaire is not. Cesare is focusing on this, what he calls the native, um, native culture. I hope that helps. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Tony. Any, any other question, comments? Thank you very much for your intervention. Um, 1956 is to the date for Aimé Césaire uh, when uh, he resigned of the Communist Party. Uh, against the problem of colonial uh, position of the Communist Party. And he spoke about uh, the definition, he questions the definition of universality. My question is, is this Congress of 1956 a sort of other questioning of universality uh, for the entire person who speak about uh, um, black uh, culture. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's a very insightful question. Because when you just look at the dates, the September, the dates of the conference is September, the letter of resignation is in October. All right? Um, so it must, he must have been thinking about it, obviously. And yes, um, you know, all the 60 speeches, and I did not go through all this, the 60, I, I just, you know, spent time, you know, in the, what I, you know, the 30 minutes and so on, 35 minutes trying to, to talk about, um, you know, what some of the issues that were posed in the conference. All of the speeches though, except, and this I think is important, except the African-American speeches were about universal and a certain, and a critique of universal and a certain kind of um, way of thinking about what Cesare would call in that letter um, the particularities of universality. In other words, as he says, that for him the universal is about the, is a kind of addition and an addition of all the particular of all particularities. There's no one universe. There's no kind of universality which is a you know which is really epistemolog epistemological. It becomes a colonial um, universality. All the African Americans do not discuss this question at all, um, and and you know it, it is the the African Americans uh, Horace Mann and uh, Horace Barnes, sorry, and, and others uh, give reports that are preoccupied with um, immediate political questions, and this is important. You know, you know you are on the cusp of the civil rights movement in the United States, and they're trying to also explain that. The other colleagues go from the from the from the from, from the Caribbean and from Africa are preoccupied with this. One of their preoccupations is about this universe, and uh, and and uh, you know, and and, and even Saint Gore is is talking about a certain universality, but his universality is about ne what he calls Negro Africa civilization, and for him, this this Negro Africa civilization that will rescue. Um, the world. I think that's a, that 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 is, that is important. So yes, you are right to point to this business of universality, um, and it is being discussed, but it's being discussed both by Caribbean and Africans, not by Africans. We can go on and on, and I'm just looking at time, and I want to thank you, Professor Bogus for the insightful presentation and the response to the questions. Can you give a
round of applause.